We know that climate change is already increasing cancer risk through increased exposure to carcinogens after extreme weather events like hurricanes and wildfires. In addition to increasing cancer risk, climate change is also impacting cancer survival. So extreme weather events can impede patients' access to preventative screenings and the ability of cancer treatment facilities to deliver care. Just in our chat today, the the passion that you have for this area and this topic is... It's something. No, oh. I know. <laughs> it is. It's contagious. That's the word I was looking for. It's very contagious in a very good way. I like to say we have two hands. One hand is to help those who need it most in the here and now. And the other hand is to prepare for the future for what will come. And oncology nurses do that really well. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Jardine, Oncology Clinical Specialist at ONS, and today we are joined by Milagros Elia, founder of M. Elia Nature-Based Healthcare Solutions in Shrub Oak, New York, to discuss an ONS grassroots approach to addressing and combating climate change and identifying its impact on cancer care. You can also earn free NCPD contact hours by completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Thanks for joining us today, Millie. Oh, thank you so much, Stephanie. It's my pleasure. So to start us off today, can you please tell us a little bit about your nursing background and what sparked your interest in environmental justice? Yes, thank you. I've been in nursing for the past 25 years, and I really came into it coming out of a neighborhood that I was born and raised in and lived most of my early adult life, which was predominantly Black and Hispanic, and it was a neighborhood of Washington Heights. And during my formative years, you know, in the 1970s, this community was known as a what's called a previously redlined neighborhood, and I experienced and saw systemic racial injustices uh, that included lack of resources, health inequities, and environmental injustices that increased our air pollution, uh, decreased the quality of life. And really, it was because of these experiences that I came into nursing with a personal understanding of the impact that environmental injustices had on the health of a community. And so that has always been with me from the onset of my nursing career. In 2001, I became an advanced practice nurse, feeling that I could give back to my profession with more autonomy. And I felt that I could move forward in the ways that I wanted to to collaborate and bring change with an advanced practice degree. And in 2016, I began my own community-based business with the same intention of improving the life of my community. Thank you for that. That is um, a very interesting way that you got into this area. And can you tell us what are some of those climate change or environmental factors that you've seen in those community that you're in? Oh, absolutely. Well, in in the original um, community that I grew up in, you know, air pollution and the physical environment played a big factor in the well-being of the individuals. So I I grew up literally at the border of a place called Asthma Alley. The children that were born and raised in that particular area, which overlapped where I lived, had a very high incident rate of asthma, uncontrolled asthma. 
And these were things at that time that were just kind of accepted by community members. We, you, you grew up in that and you accepted that and you didn't know any different. Later on is only when I began to realize that these were actually historical injustices that were being done, that we didn't have to live with that level of air pollution. The fact that there was the physical environment, there was a lack of green spaces, of safe, accessible green spaces. So it was a concrete jungle. Now, where I live, it's quite the opposite. I live in a, a suburban area quite a lot of green spaces. But even now, I can see that the economics of certain neighborhoods in this suburban area vastly affects the health and wellness of that population. And that often includes access to clean water and just educational resources. So regardless of where I've moved, once you know something, you can't unknow it. Once you've seen and understand something, you can't ununderstand it, if that makes sense. And so I can see the areas where there are gaps, even as I moved on in life. That's an interesting point that you make about once you've seen something, you can't unsee it. And you probably, it wouldn't matter where you went, even if you were traveling on vacation. You're you're so attuned to it that you almost you know they almost jump out at you and 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 you see that wherever you would go. Yes, and what really brought it home, I think, on a broad global level, was when we hit the pandemic. COVID nineteen intersected, at least here, I feel in the United States, two other issues. It was like twenty twenty was quite a quite the year with the pandemic hitting social injustices, hitting climate, you know, the, the, the front and center changes of natural disasters that were happening. And suddenly it became extremely obvious who was being the most impacted across the board. And I quickly began to find other clinicians, other nurses, that we're noticing, that we're specializing in this growing understanding. We always understood, but just not much attention was paid. And so now this is where the shift is happening. Now attention is being paid to these things. We're beginning to connect the dots. COVID was, it is really an extension of the factors that create climate change. And so If changes don't occur now, we will continue to relive our mistakes. There will be more pandemics. Climate change will continue to cause natural disasters. And so this is a really important time in history for healthcare clinicians to give voice to what we understand and bring it to the forefront to activate change. I'd like you to talk a little bit about the ONS group that you're building and the approach to climate change in relationship to cancer care. Can you tell us about that group and what the importance of this group is in today's climate? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Let me start by saying that ONS has had a long and strong history of advocacy. Nurses, through a variety of broad and specific areas of specialties, continue to engage decision makers on important issues. Within ONS, this past year, I've been very proud to help with others in our group put together an internal group dedicated to looking at the environment and environmental changes like climate change that impact patient care. And so, you know, we're not solving climate change, but we do want to look at the voice of oncology nursing, the perspective of oncology nursing in the overall environmental health and climate change as it relates to workforce issues and patient-centered care. So this group, I'm happy to say that it has been going on We've been meeting for at least two months now, and we've exponentially grown. It is an international special interest group, and it continues to grow. There is a a profound interest in looking at 
the environmental aspect of patient care in terms of uh, the pollution created, the carbon footprint that institutions have to looking at the community's involvement in projects that better the overall quality of life. We have academics, we have nurse scientists, writers, we have bedside nurses, researchers. So we have a wide gamut of oncology nurses that are very interested in this topic. And so that's really where we've started. We're still in, I would say, our infancy, and we're still working out the particulars of of how everyone is going to participate as they choose to participate. But we do have a lot of plans going on in terms of bringing forth educational resources and political advocacy opportunities. Well, that's very exciting. And the fact that it is international and how much you've grown just in that short amount of time that you've gotten together really does, I think, show the awareness and the concern of our nurses for this topic. Absolutely. And I think that comes from an understanding that how much climate change impacts both the exposure to cancer risk factors as well as the access to care. So we know that climate change is already increasing cancer risk through increased exposure to carcinogens after extreme weather events like hurricanes and wildfires. In addition to increasing cancer risk, climate change is also impacting cancer survival. So extreme weather events can impede a patient's access to preventative screenings and the ability of cancer treatment facilities to deliver care. Oncology nurses know that successful prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of cancer can require multiple visits to medical facilities. And this makes patients with cancer especially vulnerable to the effect of natural disasters on their access to care. So as climate change is altering that frequency, intensity, and the behavior of extreme weather events, it actually is exacerbating the vulnerability of communities to natural disasters by making it harder to prepare and respond to increasingly unpredictable and severe weather. One example of how this can really be the difference between life and death for cancer patient is a recent study showed that patients with non-small cell cancer were more likely to die if their radiation therapy was interrupted by a hurricane. So what is one example um, that comes to mind for me personally in which this, this uh played out on a personal level is my heritage, my my family is from Puerto Rico. So in 2018, Hurricane Maria, for example, shuttered a factory in Puerto Rico that was responsible for the bulk of small volume IV fluid bags for the entire continental United States. And so this, this is another point that what impacts one impacts all. This led to a national shortage of IV fluids and difficulties with medications that required that type of intravenous administration for many cancer treatment facilities. So extreme weather events can have impacts in healthcare systems in terms of their ability to deliver treatments, transportation, communication systems, and even power systems. So Hurricane Maria incapacitated radiation oncology services on the island during that period. They're still in recovery. So this is something that has very real day-to-day practical implications that we absolutely must face head on. And that was just one personal example, but there are many more. We have actually a researcher from the University of Puerto Rico in our group who has looked closely at her area of expertise and is continuing to deal with that. But across the board, areas like Sutter Health that had to deal with wildfires, and then how do you prepare for that? How do you con- ha- allow for a continuation of care? So this is a very important important and timely issue that oncology nurses 
are standing up to lead in how do we continue the care, the best, providing the best care for our population. Because climate change isn't going away. And so we, like I like to say, we have two hands. One hand is to help those who need it most in the here and now. And the other hand is to prepare for the future, for what will come. And oncology nurses do that really well. Those are such great examples, Millie, and it's good to put it in that context and be able to think about it that way. What are some of the key concerns that your group is looking at tackling or addressing in regards to the climate change and cancer care? Right. Some of the main issues is there's a great interest in developing educational resources for other nurses, for other clinicians, as well as for patients. It's often hard in the clinical setting to articulate with confidence the direct connection to the patient in front of you on how climate change is impacting their health. But this is increasingly important. If we're we're looking at a patient that has compromised lung function, as lung disease, who lives in an area of high risk for wildfires, and we know the, the smog that comes out of that, we must address that in care. We must be able to make that connection for them and help them create a plan of care that allows them to know when is the best time to leave the house if they have to, in terms of air quality. Members such as myself and others are very active in political advocacy and the legislations that support ONS's agenda and the increasing look at at the environmental impact on on our patients' care. We have researchers that are very interested at looking at the determinants of health and what aspects of certain communities make them more vulnerable? And then that's the hand that's reaching forward to prepare us for the future. And so we have a wide variety of interest, but it is always stemming from that same root of patient care, of caring for our colleagues, for each other, and creating the new frontier of environmental health within oncology nursing. You mentioned that you are involved in advocacy and health policy. What health policy legislation is your group currently monitoring or involved in? Right. I'll use an example because there are several that we are looking at, but one that is really top of mind right now is the Build Back Better framework, which is intended to combat the climate crisis in part. The framework will start cutting climate pollution now, and we expect it to deliver well over one gigaton, billion metric tons of greenhouse gas emission reductions by 2030. This framework will set the United States on course to meet its climate targets, achieving a 50 to 52 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions below the year 2005 levels by 2030. So we're looking at this as it addresses environmental and climate justice by supporting neighborhood equity, safety, affordable transportation access, economic development for energy and industrial transition communities, as well as community-led projects and capacity building centers for low-income and disadvantaged areas to address the disproportionate harms of pollution and climate change. And when you are supporting a bill like this, you also understand that the nurses that live in these communities, the workforce that live in these communities that benefit will benefit themselves. So nurses tend to live in the communities that they work in. So it, it really is a interconnected, symbiotic sort of relationship. A nurse cannot be separated from the community that she works in. It's inherently what affects one affects the other. So we're really looking at Build Back Better framework, and I'm excited to see you know what impact we'll have 
using our voices at that table. So Millie, you know, I've, I've been thinking as you've been talking about this and how you do have a great core group that you are building to combat this. But thinking about our listeners, as you said, you know, nurses a lot of times live in the communities where they work. So they may have, they may be very aware of what some of these issues with access to care and, you know, the social determinants of health that you've talked about. But how do those nurses understand their role in addressing these environmental factors and how they can, you know, play a part in that? Right. So helping people live their healthiest life is and has always been the essential role of all nurses. And so this goes back to the very, you know, foundation of our profession. The history of nursing is grounded in social justice and community health advocacy. And in fact, the code of ethics for nurses put forth by the American Nurses Association, for example, actually requires nurses to integrate principles of social justice into nursing and health policy. So we begin from that those roots to look at how environmental injustice impacts health. And for nurses that are looking how they can do that, for example, within the institutional setting, I would say because of the sheer number of the nursing workforce, uh, which is the largest in the healthcare profession, nearly four times the size of the physician workforce, because we are front and center, first in line with the most frequent line of contact to people of all backgrounds and experiences, being able to follow through with risk assessments, including environmental ha- hazards for those patients, doing exposure assessments, and being able to step forward and design risk management plans, addressing policy development within their institution by joining committees, collaborating across disciplines, for example, working with pharmaceuticals, the pharmacy at products and and a potential effects on the environment that these products may have and how that can be mitigated, getting involved with purchasing committees. You know, what is your hospital purchasing and how can its carbon footprint be minimized? And looking at even safer alternatives to to cleaning products used within the facility. So there are many frontline roles that nurses can play in this, in addition to educating their colleagues, educating themselves and educating their patients in the community. Political advocacy is one. I always say it, and I I, I don't mind saying it, I am one of the most timid people you would ever meet, but I find my voice in advocacy. And I have to say, I found that when I joined ONS. Alex Stone has been a great mentor and has helped me really navigate how to get involved. And so I would say any nurse, in particular speaking of oncology nurses who are interested in political advocacy, joining the organization and looking to see what groups resonate with you, what area of interest you have. Is that legislative front? Is that in education building? We're going, we're going to be seeing a lot more continuing edu- education credits uh, going towards educating nurses on these environmental impacts. Schools of nursing have already started at the undergraduate and graduate level to incorporate this into basic nursing curriculum. So there are many, many parts of this wheel And all oncology nurses have a role to play in the area that resonates most with them. And so if that's research, we have nurses that are looking at that. If that's education, absolutely, there's a place for that. And if it's political advocacy, you can find your voice in our group as well. Those are all great examples. And I think our listeners will really be able to take those ideas and 
you know, put them into action and gives them a place to start and a place to look and, you know, see how they can get involved right where they are. So thank you for giving those examples to them. What other nurse-led organizations or groups across the country share similar values and goals with your group? Absolutely. I'll start by saying there is quite a number of environmentally focused healthcare clinician groups. Ones that are specifically nurse-led are like the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. They are dedicated to political advocacy and supporting nurses in obtaining accurate, timely, incredible scientific information on environmental health nursing. So they're a leading voice in this. The ANA, which has had an environmental aspect to their organization for quite some time, is now launching an advisory committee on planetary health, which I'm honored to have been appointed to. And we're actually launching this month. So there's going to be a lot more uh, happening with that. There are larger clinician groups that are interdisciplinary, not just nursing, such as the Planetary Health Alliance, which has a clinician-based focus group, and Climate for Health Ambassador Program, which is put through by Echo America, is another example of an interdisciplinary group. But honestly, I have yet personally to find another oncology-based nursing organization that has a special interest group dedicated to oncology nurses interested in environmental health and climate change as as we've developed an ONS. I have not, and I've, I belong to quite, quite a lot of uh, groups, and so I'm speaking on the global level. I haven't seen another group dedicated to the oncology nursing perspective in this area, but there are wonderful other groups that are nurse-led for general nursing and as well as interdisciplinary groups that, that have a wealth of information. But I'm really looking to see how oncology nurses, which are, which are really the leading voice in, in patient care, we, nursing is the most trusted profession. How can we take, not reinvent, but take the information that these other organizations provide and how can we refine them and customize them to meet the needs of our unique population? So there is a wealth of information out there. For those of us who belong to Sigma Theta Tau Nursing, I'm in the process of submitting the documentation to petition for a similar group for Sigma Nursing. There's a number of options and opportunities for nurses who are interested, both free and, you know, if you pay to join a certain organization, but whatever, you know, economics you want to uh, invest in this, there are opportunities to learn and to be part of the movement. Well, Millie, it sounds like you're blazing a trail with this in this area and with the group that you have brought together, you know, with ONS members. And it's really exciting. And, you know, I can just just in our chat today, the the passion that you have for this area and this topic is it's something. No, uh, I know what you mean. <laughs> it is. It's contagious. That's the word I was looking for. It's very contagious in a very good way. Uh, so I just want to finish our talk um, today with a couple of quick fire questions for you, like I do with every one of our podcasts. And the first one that I have is what are some common misconceptions about how climate change and the environment affect cancer care? I would say one of the most common that I that I found is that oncology nursing, the environment is not in our lane. Stay in your lane is the kind of feedback that I've that I had been encountering. I think things are beginning to change now. I think with education and with climate change and the the you know 2020 bringing so much to the forefront 
I think that the connection is is being made, although it may not always be clear to everyone how to articulate the connection. I think it's rapidly the movement is taking off, but I think that 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 definitely was initially a a misconception that that we that we were not environmentalist. The other misconception is one thing that I have personally been told is that climate change, there's nothing we can really, as oncology nurses, as nurses, we can really do to change this. And that what is of even greater importance at the moment is COVID-19. And what I have to say is, number one, nursing, nurses, oncology nurses can absolutely make an impact. And the issues, again, that caused the pandemic overlap with the same issues that have contributed to climate change. One is not of a lesser importance and climate change is no longer, it can no longer be on the periphery of healthcare as an afterthought or something that is not impacting our patients on a day-to-day basis. Great. Next question. What's something about climate change or the environmental effect on cancer that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? The painful lack of access to care that marginalized communities experience is more than just a phrase. I have had the privilege in my own personal journey in nursing to to try and contribute, to volunteer my time in trying to help in as much as I could with some of the most marginalized communities in cancer care in the United States. So the Navajo Nation in Arizona, eye-opening experience. For people who think that environmental justice doesn't play into cancer care or don't understand how the how climate changes can impact that it, look no further <laughs> that community has has been historically just absolutely marginalized decimated you have limited paved roads you have i believe it's only a third of households with running water how do you go, get through cancer treatments when You can't even wash your hands in your own home if you're not one of the ones that has running water. The list goes on and on and on. As I mentioned before, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, the island is still coming to terms with the devastation and having to make the repairs. So I think that's the depth of how devastating these connection points are, I think it's it's not always understood. And we have to take it from just talk, just, you know, what you read on the, in the newspaper to a deeper level of understanding. And that's where nurses really excel at looking at their populations and looking at the social determinants of health. What makes that population more vulnerable? We must not be afraid to look at what makes our populations the most vulnerable and how can we help? How can we prepare for the future while helping them now? Thank you. And next, what additional training or education do oncology nurses need to fully understand the impact of the climate on cancer care? Oncology nurses should understand the scientific principles and underpinnings of the relationship between individuals or or populations and the environment, which includes the work environment. So this includes basic mechanisms and pathways of exposure to environmental hazards, basic prevention and control strategies, what interdisciplinary practice can look like in this learning process and research. And so at the clinical practice level, knowing how to assess and make referrals, all nurses should be able to complete or have the training to complete an environmental health history, recognize those potential environmental hazards, and make the appropriate referrals for the conditions that have probable environmental etiologies. So broadly speaking, nurses who are interested 
in any of these aspects of environmental health and community health in respect to their practice can access free educational training across populations by reading ONS publications from several of our own members, looking again at the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. There's a plethora of of free information that is available that can bring nurses up to date who may feel like they need some, some reinforcement in their knowledge or some new knowledge. Perfect. And are there any additional resources for patients or providers who want to learn more that you could recommend? Yes, I actually became certified as a Climate for Health Ambassador through a program run through Echo America. And it's a free program. You go through the training, it's a month long training, and it provides you with a way to understand and articulate this impact of climate change on patient care and offers opportunities to advocate both at the community level, the institutional level, and and at higher legislative levels. Annie, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, also offers free information. There's a downloadable free ebook on this topic. Nurses who are interested can absolutely find out more information in depth through this resource. Another organization, the Planetary Health Alliance, has wonderful resources available to both patients and clinicians, and they have an emerging what they call seed box that provides verbiage, that provides languaging on making this connection between health and climate in the clinical setting, whether you're speaking to hospital leadership or directly to a patient. So languaging is really important. Once you have the understanding, then how do you translate that for other people to understand? This has been just a pleasure to speak with you today and to learn more from you about climate change and the environment and how oncology nurses can become more aware, become more involved, and just do what we do best, as you said, really take the lead on cancer care for the patients that we serve. So I really appreciate your time with us. Do you have any final comments? Thank you so much, Stephanie. This has been a a real pleasure. I would just like to say that this has been the work of many people coming together and this is definitely a movement. And so it's not about any one of us, it's all of us, the collective. And I would invite anyone interested, even remotely interested in our group's focus to contact me. I'm happy to, with no obligation to add you to our listserv. You'll be made aware of updates, uh, opportunities, educational resources. And if anyone is interested in having a more in-depth educational presentation done at their institution or organization, let me know as well. That can be arranged. But thank you for your time and, and your interest in this topic. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak on it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you downloaded your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guests and not necessarily ONS.